The day he died, though, uh, um, he said a very, very strange thing to me. We had been to the groundbreaking at the University of South Florida Bay Campus in St. Petersburg, and he'd been one of the people with a shovel. He'd heard Chester Ferguson, who the Likes Brothers chairman, who is now dead, but he heard Chester Ferguson publicly brag on him as one of the key contributors to the growth of that university, which meant so much to him. Then we went to the Yacht Club for a lunch, and all these fancy people were, were making speeches, lauding Nelson Pointer, because he'd given a half million dollars to help acquire some of the land that those university buildings were going on. And they even asked him to speak, and he made a graceful little talk, funny talk. I got a lot of laughs, because there are a lot of Tampa people here in St. Petersburg. He mentioned, you know, uh, I'm so glad to see hands across the bay again. He said, uh, in this great university undertaking, uh, he said, Tampa and St. Petersburg have so very much in common. And he started spoofing. He said, now, take Tampa Airport. Tampa builds an airport. St. Petersburg uses it. He said, Tampa gets a professional football team. St. Petersburg goes to see them play. <laughs> and and uh, he enjoyed himself, and everybody enjoyed him. But everybody bragged on him that day. And so we left the Yacht Club in my little old 65 Mustang to drive back to the office. And he was riding with me. He was the worst driver in the world. I, I always made sure he didn't drive. I always said, well, won't you ride with me? And coming back, he was ruminating. He said, I've never heard so many nice things said about me. He said, this is so uncharacteristic. And then he sort of snorted a little laugh, and he said, they must think I'm going to die. And that's the very day he died, because we got back to the parking lot. And I noticed he was having difficulty getting out of the car. His leg was troubling him. But Nelson hated physical disability and hated anybody to notice. And so I waved to Jack Lake, who'd parked his car nearby. And the two of us literally had to support Nelson as we took him back to his office. And then he said, isn't anybody going to do any work around here? And made us go back to our offices. But later he tried to stand up and fell, and his secretary called us. We took him to the hospital. And the last time I saw him, he was in the emergency room joking with Charles Donegan, his good friend and doctor, and uh, making jokes with him and, and insisting that I get on back to the office and do some work. And he died that night. He truly was so modest that he never saw himself as being, as becoming famous as a result of the work he did at the St. Petersburg Times and CQ. He saw the institutions themselves as being the important thing. And he saw the management that he had assembled here. They were just about the very best circulation, advertising, production, editors, the very best in, all across the board work in St. Petersburg. And that, he said, now this is what, what should live, and it will. But you can't divorce the man from his contributions either. So he, he would have been the last to expect uh, that, that his name would reverberate along with Pulitzer and Hearst and, and, and the other great ones down there, and the Salzburgers and Grahams, but it will. Well, I came from, to St. Petersburg directly from Yale in the summer of 1927 because the boom was over. The Times Publishing Company, which had been acquired by my father in 1912, largely at the prodding of my mother who had come to Florida with her father in the 80s. And we had spent winters at New Smyrna. And uh, so this was part of, uh, of a small chain of papers that my father had. The Kokomo Dispatch in Indiana, the Seymour Democrat, the Sullivan paper, the original family paper, Columbus, uh, Indiana, Noblesville, Indiana, later the Hickory Record in North Carolina. And uh, because of the enormous debt incurred during the boom in building that, that eight-story building, from which we still operate, it's been added to, of course, a great deal in the last 50 years, I learned the business side of newspapering pretty fast. It was a crash course, literally. And uh, among the uh, assets was the Clearwater Sun. And so I had a crash course in Clearwater, too, because uh, I knew the paper had to be sold. And so I got it in shape, 
advertised it for sale, found a buyer, and uh, I made $25,000 on that deal. <laughs> it was a great deal of yes. money, and I thought it was quite natural that a Yale graduate uh, who was, uh, well, let's see, I would have been about uh, 25 years old, it would make $25,000 his first year out of college, and uh, thought nothing of it. But I also bought the Kokomo Dispatch, and then came the stock market crash in 1929, and uh, the dispatch was deeply in debt, and so was I personally. So I lost my $25,000. <laughs> Father needed help. There was more of a burden of management on him, and he was still deeply in debt with a scattered bunch of creditors. And I felt I could be of some real help there, but I previously had a family option whereby I, I've said repeatedly, you know, I love my family. It's a strong bunch of individuals, my sister, my mother, my father. And I knew I did not want to publish a newspaper with any one or all of them that would be impossible. I, I just am too jealous of my own independence there to be able to work uh, in that frame. So I started buying the paper, uh, paying off some of the debts to reclaim the collateral of the stock of the times and that kind of thing. And this went on for a number of years until 1947 when I got majority stock and I've been consolidating that ever since. That's all I want, is to put out the best newspaper in the country. I think I can contribute more to self-government by setting a standard of integrity, of public service, and financial success by concentrating on the newspaper business. And so that is the thread. Thank goodness I've lived long enough <laughs> to have at least partially achieved that high goal. No one who is a perfectionist, and I admit to being so, is ever satisfied, of course, with a picture or a piece of music or a garden. But you can at least do your best and still know that it can be better. And I think that we have the foundation for doing that. Well over 50% of the controversial issues at any one time, more of our readers agree with us than disagree. It's the three or four or six uh, special issues that they may not agree with. You take on the racial thing. We were, we were ahead of any paper in the South in our opposition to segregation long before 1954 when the Supreme Court ruled that schools could not be segregated anymore. That was one of the toughest issues, of course, in which there seemed to be no way to reconcile it. The South has changed and people have changed. It was an unmentionable subject often at a dinner party or whatnot. Today, uh, it's not even a subject of discussion anymore. So uh, I think they like a newspaper that uh, is willing to take an unpopular stand on a vital issue. And we certainly have not hesitated to do that over the years, and I think they respect us for it. We give a tremendous amount of space to uh, politics. Self-government, of course, is the most important thing we have to preserve and promote and implement. I don't think we can have self-government without newspapers. And if newspapers are going to reflect only one party or one candidate, we don't get the wholesome competition at the voting booth that makes self-government work in the last analysis. 
So first of all, we, we give a lot of free space. Of course, no candidate, no party will ever think that you're giving enough space to their side. And therefore, uh, instead of handbills, a more efficient, more economical way of reaching large numbers of people is through advertising. When I came here in 1938, uh, we charged, like most newspapers, charged a very high premium for political advertising. Uh, that was true of circus advertising. If they could get it, because that was the only access they had to the public, uh, uh, publishers generally charged them a very high price for it. Uh, we changed that. We gave them the same rates as a merchant who would use an equal amount of space so that we made first-class citizens, in my judgment, of uh, political candidates and political parties. I have worked in Washington off and on <laughs> since 1923, when I had my first job as reporter there with Scripps Howard at the Washington Daily News, which was quite new at that time. And over the years, I realized how badly uh, Congress was reported. Quite literally, as a reader or as an editor, it was impossible for you to reconstruct the voting record of your two senators or your congressman in the case of an election uh, the, the election would long be over before you could really give your readers, as a writer on politics and public affairs, a clear picture of, of uh, their three representatives in the Congress. And uh, so we set out to do something about that. It had been tried a few times before in the latter part of the 19th century, uh, Paul Douglas in his memoirs mentions this. And of course, like so many experiments of that kind, um, it involves more work and money than the people who enthusiastically get the idea started. And uh, uh, so that has changed. I meet uh, young newspaper people in Washington frequently and am introduced as chairman of the board of Congressional Quarter <laughs> and uh, one of the founders of it. And they're astonished that I'm still living <laughs> because they think it's been there forever since the beginning of the Republic. <laughs> and uh, uh, they're astonished to know that it really started in the middle 40s. Uh, it's something that, that does help self-government work better. Uh, through other writers and broadcasters and teachers, because it has a com tremendous constituency among the schools, high schools as well as colleges, it even gets into some grammar schools, uh, they know considerably more about that third branch of government so this has expanded uh, political and public affairs coverage. And um, it's very easy to go back and reconstruct uh, the debate on this or that of, of any important issue uh, up to 30 years ago now. I got out of college rather young and and in those days, they didn't have these traveling fellowships. And I had grown up during War I. And uh, my great heroes at that time, naturally, were the war correspondents. And I wanted to see the world, and so I worked my way out there. I was headed for China because that was the only place that a war was going on at the time. Uh, several months later, when I got there, the war was over. It was one of these warlord things. And so my money ran out, of course, even though I'd worked my way 
there, and I got a job on the Japan Times. It was an English language newspaper. They said they didn't have a job, and I said, well, like all papers, they were short-handed. I thought they were. And I said, well, could I just work around here, not charge you for it? And I, I was able to produce enough printable copy in a relatively short time that they were sort of ashamed of themselves and put me on the payroll. <laughs> I learned an awful lot exposing. I, I traveled the cheapest way because that was the only way I could afford, and it was a great education itself. The uh, idealism of Woodrow Wilson in World War I and the fight in the Versailles Treaty and all was very new at that time all over the world. And there were these young politicians in the Philippines, for instance, who were wide-eyed, starry-eyed over the concept that they could have self-government, that that war really was the war to make the world safe for democracy. And I met some of the people who were later leaders. Um, and. Uh, they were young and interested in public affairs, and so a young newspaper man naturally would meet them and all. And uh, so it gave me a feeling and a glimpse for many parts of the world that I still retain to this day. Um, that's one reason why I have never been really afraid of communism. It won't work. And there are these, <clears throat> there are these seeds of idealism in all the countries of the world that you can suppress them for over 30 years, 40 years, like Franco did in Spain. And once you just let that cork the least bit out of the bottle, these ideas that are so much better than communism will come out. And uh, that's why uh, you know we can't afford <clears throat> to sell the idea of self-government short. Most people in their lifetime don't have a chance to work with a uh, legitimate genius, and he was a, an absolute 14 karat gold <laughs> genius, uh, which doesn't make him easy, but it's, a, it's, an, it's an enriching experience to spend even a few years with, uh, with someone who stands out above, above the crowd, and, and he really did. He really did. The standards of ownership of a newspaper or radio enterprise sort of a manifesto embodying his philosophy of journalism as well as his practical policies for the St. Petersburg Times and at that time radio station WTSP. Ownership or participation in ownership of a publication or broadcasting property is a sacred trust and a great privilege. He really believed that uh, and he repeated it uh, frequently and he enforced it um, within the new, within the staff, in other words, uh, if something, uh, if some uh, proposal came up or an idea came up that he didn't think was in the best interests of our readers, mm -hmm. then uh, this we would hear about the sacred trust <laughs> every time. And uh, uh, I think that I think that of all of the of all of the points in the standards of ownership mm -hmm. that was Nelson's most important. I, think. I don't think he was first a businessman. Um, I think he was first an editor. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was quite conscious of the importance of a paper being profitable. Uh, but I think he thought of him, I don't think he ever thought of himself as a businessman. He thought of himself as an editor. And um, he never called himself a publisher. He never had that title. And uh, I, he didn't see any any value in it. He used to say that 
um, if he could rub a little lamp and have one wish, that it, people would say, I don't agree with very many things that the Times puts on its editorial page, but it's fair. It's fair. And uh, I don't think he ever felt we were totally fair. <laughs> he was never <laughs> happy. <laughs> he was never happy. I think that newspapers uh, around the country are aware of his contribution to quality journalism. It's not an accident that the papers of Florida are better than perhaps any other state as a whole. Uh, Pointer set some standards that they they just they followed. They had to, and uh, I think that this is um, has been true with papers everywhere. He was not bothered with false modesty, mm -hmm. and yet he was he was a modest man. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't want to blow his own horn, but I think he had a a truly developed sense of history, and he saw himself the role in that history of the American press. And I think, I think that he was right. I, I agree with him. Back as early as 1960, Pointer was talking about doing something of an educational nature. At that time, he had the feeling that uh, something needed to be done for younger reporters. He used to say, you know, we spend a lot of money recruiting a bright young man, and then we give him tender loving care for a year or 18 months. And then we just cut him adrift until such time as he becomes an assistant city editor or something and, and is able to go to American Press Institute or something else. So he saw something, which, and as a matter of fact, our working title originally was Junior API because we just, you know, we didn't have anything else to work with. But we wrote a lot of memos and did a lot of things. He was, and we get back to the standards here, where um, he was afraid that on his death, that we would be forced to sell the paper because, you see, the book value when he bought it was maybe five million dollars. On today's market, it was worth maybe 150 million. So think of the inheritance taxes that would have had to been paid. Well, it wouldn't have been possible. It was, there's no way it would have been possible. But, but there were a lot of ways he could have overcome that. Uh, he could have given the given the uh, papers, the stock in the papers to Yale University, which would have been the same thing. But he wanted to create something that would improve the breed, that would make American newspapers better. And he worked long and hard on the plans for this institute. And it's we set it up. It's a unique thing. There's no other like it. But what he did, he gave his personal fortune. To, to the future of American newspapers. He could have just as well left it to his family. He could have left it to Indiana University. He could have set up a foundation which would fund um, aspiring writers who want to travel around the world. There's all kinds of things that he could have done, but he, d he elected to do this. It's an enormous gamble because um, Gene Patterson uh, knows what Nelson wanted, and uh, but he's trusting Gene and he's trusting the person Gene picks to succeed him and the person that person s succeed him uh, to to continue the things that uh, Nelson stood for. I think a generation from now it's conceivable that he will be even better known and one of the reasons is this Pointer Institute for Media Studies because we are not only training newspaper people, but we're training future newspaper people, students, who will be publishing tomorrow's newspapers. And so I think that if it, it's quite possible that Pointer's standards and his philosophies will trickle down a generation from now. Did you and Nelson um, like each other from the beginning? Do you remember? I would say yes. Uh, he was a friendly sort of a man. I, I liked the expression in his face. I liked his eyes. They were brown, weren't they? Mm -hmm. And uh, we became good friends. And um, remained so for, well, until he died. We had many encounters, all friendly. Friendly because uh, we reached an understanding very early in our relationship 
The understanding was that uh, there were certain subjects on which we could probably not agree, many subjects on which we could agree. They were the subjects like uh, what's good for St. Petersburg, what can be done to improve life in St. Petersburg. On that subject, we were in complete agreement all the time. Uh, Nelson, as you know, was a very compassionate man, and he had a, a great interest in the other people, especially people who had not been so fortunate. And uh, that trait, I think, caused him to be misunderstood by some people uh, who felt he was too much inclined uh, to help the underdog. And uh, in fact, so much so that uh, they felt he had socialistic tendencies. Or even communistic. Oh, well, I wasn't <laughs> going to say that. <laughs> If you had to describe Nelson in a word or a phrase, how would you describe him? I'd, I would describe him as a very conscientious, uh, knowing where he was going. You know, Nelson was never uncertain about things. He was rather a positive person in my contacts with him, and uh, uh, he was a very caring person. Now, I know that I have, uh, in my 50 years of, uh, of community and civic work here in St. Petersburg, that I never had to call Nelson Pointer one time, ever. I never had asked Nelson for a favor. Nelson always called me. When he would see that I was chairman of something, he'd call and say, Catherine, what can the Times and Independent do for you? How to much, help do, you, you with how your much do you need? <laughs> uh, he was one. Uh, I, always, I always felt that I had achieve something by being able to work with Nelson as long as I had because he was a very tough fellow to work for. He, very, he was uh, tough in, in the sense that he uh, demanded uh, a good sense of perfection and uh, I think in, in my working relationship with he and the Times I, I felt that by, by maintaining a long relationship I had certainly achieved what I thought was one of his greatest characteristics, and that was uh, the people I saw around him were selected. Uh, he, he certainly uh, chose them well, and, uh, and he, as far as I could see, he demanded of each of the people that worked with him a great deal. So he got a lot, a lot for his money. He demanded a lot of you, too. Sure. regarded Jack Holland as one of his good friends. Really oh, good he friends. did. You know, now, I remember when they were trying to um, establish the University of South Florida here. Nelson was very, as you know, interested in it. And he felt that, uh, that we had to have a good library before we could sell that um, to the state to have a branch here. So I remember that he called uh, Ed Wright and Jack Holland, and he said, look, I want this, because I want to establish it. <laughs> and you know, when Nelson spoke, you helped him. Well, you, yes. yes. <laughs> and then on the other hand, when you spoke, he helped you. <laughs> That's right. I told Nelson, you know, I, I'm not real liberal. He said, oh, yes, you are, Charles, or you wouldn't be a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think uh, Nelson, uh, after Henrietta passed away, uh, she also died of a cerebral hemorrhage, mm -hmm. as you probably know, yes. um, that uh, he became uh, less liberal and uh, more considerate, we'll say, uh, of the middle of the road. Because I think this may be true of everyone. The older they live, the more and the richer they, they and the richer they get. Well, I was a little reluctant to say that. <laughs> I think that is a is a fact. I always though. remember once I asked Nelson, because you remember the early stories that he was a communist and sure. he belonged to the party and all sure. that. Carried his card in his and shoe. And he was trying desperately to get a radio station and also a TV station. I said, well, "What do you want with a radio station?" I said, "One thing, Charles, make money." <laughs> Thank you.
after all this talk, uh, you're so conscious of the inadequacy of uh, a few anecdotes to sum up this extraordinary life of a man as richly variegated as Nelson Pointer. Uh, the man had endless strengths and made uncountless contributions. And that poor words such as I can summon are so inadequate to describe who he was and what he meant. But I somehow believe that the enduring, ongoing monuments that he left here, the St. Petersburg Times, Congressional Quarterly, the Pointer Institute for Media Studies, will demonstrate as the years go on what uh, the life of that founder meant. And he was, in every sense, the founder of this enormous enterprise that is so highly motivated and so successful. Successful materially, because he believed without saying it, because it's a little too biblical for him, that bread cast on the waters does return many fold. He believed that quality was its own reward. And that if you do things, as he put it, better, faster, and cheaper in American free enterprise, then uh, you'll get your reward. And certainly through the St. Petersburg Times and its growth, uh, devoted to quality and the very highest ideals, uh, that it has led to the assembly here of extraordinary people on its staff and to an extraordinary readership uh, to whom it's totally dedicated and independent of any other newspaper connection. So how do you describe the man who made all that possible? The answer is that uh, I can't, you can't. But uh, this is just uh, a few notes, uh, certainly not the, uh, the, uh, the overall whole picture of a man who was so much larger than I can find words to describe. This has been David Shedden talking with Mr. Eugene Patterson, the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Times Publishing Company, for Governor Bob Graham's oral history program honoring the late Nelson Pointer. Thank you, Mr.